is uh, from Brains to Silicon, Applying Lessons from Neuroscience to Machine Learning. Uh, I'm going to be doing this talk with my uh, co-worker and collaborator, uh, Subutai Ahmad. Uh, so we're going to be doing this a, a joint talk here. Um, we work at a company called Nementa. We've been uh, there for about 16 years. It's just a research, uh, independent research company. And we have two goals. One is, uh, uh, both are pretty ambitious. Uh, the first one is to reverse engineer the neocortex. And the second one is to apply what we've learned from that to AI and machine learning. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the first topic, and then I'm going to turn, turn it over to Subutai, and he's going to talk about the second topic uh, in this talk. So let's just jump right into it. Um, hopefully everyone recognizes this line drawing. It's a line drawing of a human brain. Uh, the neocortex uh, is about 70% of the volume of a human brain. It, it's, a, it's a sheet of cells about the size of a dinner napkin, 1,500 centimeters squared, square centimeters. And... Um, it's, a, it's about 70% of our brain um, and it wraps around other older parts of the brain. It is uh, the organ of intelligence. So, um, whoops, I'm trying to get this off the thing off my screen here. Excuse me one second here. I'm, uh, I'd like to remove this. Well, I'll have to deal with it. Part of my screen is obscured. Um, it is the organ of intelligence. Uh, so uh, everything we think about intelligence happens in the neocortex. All of our high-level sensory perception, whether it's vision, touch, or hearing, uh, all of our sort of uh, conscious or uh, uh, thoughtful motor behaviors, when we move our limbs or moving our fingers, manipulating objects, the vocalization, like my speech now is being generated by the neurons in my neocortex. All forms of language are created and understood in the neocortex, whether it's written language, spoken language, language of mathematics, music, et cetera, and high-level abstract thoughts. Um, all things we might think about, whether it's mathematics, uh, science, engineering, the arts, and so on. It's all the product of the neocortex. It's an amazing organ. It has some really remarkable attributes. Um, it learns continuously. It never stops. There's, if you're awake, you're learning. You're learning new things. You've already learned some things, uh, even maybe trivial things, but you've learned some things already in my talk. Um, and it never stops. We're always constantly uh, learning new things. It learns very rapidly. Uh, often one exposure to something uh, will be sufficient for you to uh, get a new concept or understand a new object or something like that. Um, you, don't have to, you don't have to expose it to a thousand or a million different iterations of something to get it to train. It's extremely efficient as uh, people in this conference know, uh, 20 watts approximately for the entire brain. And uh, it's incredibly flexible. Um, we can learn thousands of tasks. And we do learn thousands of tasks in our lives. Uh, we're learning new ones all the day. Every, just everything we do is we, we've learned these procedures, how to cook and clean and move about and use bicycles and so on. We're just constantly learning new ones. And, and these are things we didn't evolve to do. So the brain is extremely flexible in the cortex and what it can learn. It's not just a set of tricks. It's, it's a general purpose machine of some sort. Um, now it goes without saying that today's AI and machine learning is not as capable as the human brain, not even close. And I wanna emphasize not even close because it really, we are like light years away from what the, what the cortex can do. Um, and uh, we should not lose, uh, lose sight of that fact. Um, so in my talk, I'm going to tell you about some things we've learned about the neocortex. And we've made a lot of re progress recently in the last five or six years. Um, and I'm going to tell you about them. Um, this is basically the outline of my talk. I'm going to talk about how the neocortex learns a model of the world. That's the way to think about it. It's not a computer. It's not an inference engine. It learns a model of the world. Um, that model is distributed, which would not be surprising. But the way it's distributed is surprising. Um, and it turns out that they are, there are thousands of complete yet complementary models of everything we know. Um, and so your, your brain is really a very highly distributed modeling system. And these independent models vote to reach a consensus. And that's what you're aware of. And then the basic unit of uh, computation in the cortex is the cortical column. I'm going to talk about that. And what we understand is that cortical columns are complete, rep they're complete modeling systems. And they work on, the, they implement a type of reference frame. And that's the key. That's the trick to how, understanding how this whole thing works. Um, all of our knowledge is, 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 is stored in reference frames. And I'll explain that briefly. And then it's a little bit hard to imagine how the brain does reference frames, how neurons do this. And so what we now understand is that there are some um, older parts of the brain um, that, uh, that we don't, that do reference them called grid cells and play cells. And we believe the neocortex is built on the same basic neural mechanism. So we now know a lot about how the neurons actually do this. Okay, so let's just go into it. Um, uh, the neocortex learns a model of the world. And, um, you know, I can't actually see the top of my screen, so I don't like exactly what it says here, but um, 
Uh, what do I mean by that? The, the, the number of things you know is huge. Uh, if you sit down and try to think about all the stuff you know, uh, you know thousands of physical objects. You know what they look like. You know what they feel like. Uh, you know what they sound uh, when you use them. Uh, we know how objects are composed of other objects. So that's how the world is built up. So if I think about a bicycle, it's composed of wheels and a frame and, and, and tires and chains and so on. And we learn that compositional structure that's stored in the neocortex. Uh, we know where objects are located in the world relative to each other. We know how objects behave. So, so objects move like my smartphone. If you touch the screen, it does certain things. If you touch the button, it does other things. We have to learn all these uh, sensory motor contingencies. Um, and we also know, we, we know things which are not physical. Uh, we might call them conceptual objects, such as with mathematics and democracy. We have knowledge about these things. We have a model of them in our head. We're able to manipulate our, uh, these things and think about them. So we have this incredible model in our head. Uh, we use the model um, to, uh, in, to infer our current situation in the world and to generate goal-oriented goal -oriented behavior. So you literally have recreated the world in your head. And because of that, you can imagine what will happen when you do certain things. And you say, well, how would I achieve this goal? How would I achieve that goal? The model is a predictive model, uh, meaning it's constantly making predictions. I wrote about this in Unintelligence. Um, and um, in prediction error, like when, you, when you, your brain expects one thing and something else happens, is the primary training signal. It tells the neocortex that something is wrong about its model, and then your attention is drawn to that thing, and, um, uh, and then you update the model of, of, of that thing you're paying attention to. Now, the question is, is how does the architecture of the neocortex support learning this model? You can think of the neocortex as other ways, but I think this is the right way to think about it. And the question is, how is this knowledge stored in the neural tissue as we know it exists uh, that learns all this stuff and it's all stored in your head? And so that's, the, that's what we have set out to, to try to understand. If you look at the neocortex and you see this sheet of cells, uh, it's divided up into columns. And if I say the columns width are a little bit variable, if I say there's about a millimeter in diameter, uh, there's be about 150,000 of them and they span the, the, the depth of the cortex, two and a half millimeters. Now, if you actually look at the neocortex, you won't see this. If you look under a microscope, you will not see columns. They don't physically are not differentiated, but we know they exist. And the main reason we know they exist is illustrated in this diagram uh, from Vernon Mountcastle which here you see a, a hand of a monkey in this case, and there's these little circles on it. Those represent the patches of, of skin. Each of those patches of the skin has many uh, uh, sensors in them, and they send a bundle of nerve fibers up to the cortex. Um, in the cortex are shown here six sort of uh, cartoon drawings of columns. And, um, uh, and each column, would, the reason we say a column exists is because all the cells in one column res are responding to the patch of skin in the circle below. And if you were to put a probe through the cortex at a diagonal, as shown in this diagram, you'd see all the cells responding to one patch of skin, and then immediately they jump to the next patch of skin. And then they all respond to that one, and then immediately jump to the next patch of skin. So it's this sort of organization of, of input that really defines the existence of a column. So a column is basically processing input from a single sensory patch. And this is true in, the, in vision too, uh, and auditory. Uh, in vision, a, a patch of the retina goes to one column, and the next patch of the retina goes to another column. Um, in, we, people have been studying the details of what goes on inside the cortical column for over 120 years. Um, the figures on your left are from Cajal back in 1899. And immediately they start seeing, well, there's, there's these different cell types in there. They have different densities, different um, shapes. And so when you look at it, you start seeing these layers of cells. Um, and then if you look at the connections between the cells, they're mostly vertical across the layers. So information comes into a column and it gets processed by going up and down, up and down. And people like ourselves make diagrams like this on the right, which show, um, uh, you know, we try to say, okay, what are these different layers? What kind of connections do they make? What are their, what are their attributes and so on? Um, there are, I'm not joking, probably tens of thousands of papers published on the anatomy and physiology of the neocortex, and I can't review them, but I want to go through three basic high-level thoughts. One is columns are complex. They contain about 100,000 neurons, 500 million synapses, uh, there are dozens of cell types. There are hundreds of mini columns within these columns. And so we can say for certainty, whatever a column does is complex. It's not a simple thing. It's not a filter. It's not a, uh, you know, a pattern recognizer. <laughs> it's doing some complex computation. Um, another surprising observation, which uh, people have known for a long time, but they kind of forget, is that columns, all columns have a motor output. That everywhere you look in the neocortex, there are cells in every column that project someplace else that have a motor relation related uh, output. So for example, columns in the visual cortex that get input directly from the retina project back to the part of the brain that moves the eyes. 
And so um, vision is a sensory motor process. Even hearing is that way. The columns that get input from the ears project part to the, back to the part of the brain that moves the head, which is equivalent to moving the eyes. Um, and then finally, the columns are remarkably similar. That they, they all have a similar architecture, whether it doesn't matter what sensory modality they're involved in or whether they're involved in language or and it's true across species, there are differences between the columns. And so people spend a lot of time trying to figure out what those differences, but the amount of commonality is remarkable. And so this led to uh, Bernard Mountcastle again, making a speculation in 1979 that all the columns look similar because they perform the same intrinsic function. He says, well, what makes a column like an auditory column is because it's connected to an ear. What makes a, a visual column is because it's connected to the eyes. This is such a, a, an amazing idea that some people still have trouble believing it, but the evidence is overwhelming that this is true. And so he pointed out that if you can understand what a, a column does, you pretty much, you'll, you'll figure out, you might be able to figure out what the whole thing does. So really our work then came down to like, well, what is the processing that goes on in a single cortical column? So I'm gonna skip ahead to a lot of stuff. I'm gonna uh, blank my screen now for a second. Hopefully you can still see me on your screen. I'm gonna tell you about a little thought experiment that, that actually happened about uh, four years ago or so, uh, five years ago. And um, that really gave us an insight to what's going on. I was holding this uh, coffee cup, a one just like it. Uh, hopefully you can see it, um, it's an inventor coffee cup. And I was just playing around with it and my hand was touching it and I was thinking about prediction. I said, well, my finger, his, my index finger is touching the cup. And, um, and as I move it, it, it predicts what it's gonna feel. So I can even right now, I can just imagine if I lift my finger up and put it down here, I'm gonna feel this rounded edge of the lip. And I know if I bring it down to the bottom of the cup, I'll feel this rough unglazed part. And if I move over here, I'll feel this, and I can anticipate this feeling the handle on this side. And so I said to myself, well, how do my brain is making that prediction? What does it need to know to predict what my finger is gonna feel? The exact sensation that my finger is gonna feel. And it has to know several things, but two basic ones. It needs to know that it's touching a coffee cup and it needs to know where it is relative to the cup. And it needs to know where it will be after it starts, after it stops moving. So I, to anticipate the feel of the slip, I have to know, my brain has to know where it will be relative to the cup. The cup could be in different positions, it can different orientations. What matters is my finger's position relative to the cup. And this tells us that, that the brain has to have a reference frame attached to the cup. It has to have some way of noting locations relative to this cup that, that travel with the cup and, and independent of my body. Um, and that was a, a real insight. And then we quickly realized, well, the same thing has happened if you touch the cup with multiple fingers, each finger is feeling something different. Each finger is making its own prediction. And so each finger, the input has to have a reference frame associated, uh, it's the same reference frame of the cup, but it has to know its location in that reference frame. So this is a big insight. And um, we published this paper and oh gosh, I wish I could get rid of this thing at the top of my screen. Oh, there, I can just move it down here. Um, it's uh, uh, called in uh, 2017 called the theory of how columns in the near cortex enable learning of the structure of the world. In this paper, we basically said, look, what's going on in the cortical column, there's some sensory input coming in from your finger here. And, um, but it's being paired with the location in a reference frame, an allocentric reference frame of the object that's being sensed. And when you move your finger over the cup, what you're, what you're able to do is build up a complete model of the cup. You can learn the structure of a cup with one finger by just moving it around the surface and you're building up like a CAD 3D sort of CAD model. And this is going on in a single cortical column. Um, so then we went to the next step. We said, well, look, what's, what's uh, the next thing you need to do is, is it, but this is changing every time you move your finger, but we have a perception of the cup that's stable. Why is this not working now? This, this, I have this band of something on my screen here. Let's try it again, here we go. Um, uh, so we say, well, there's going to be another layer of cells, which are sort of representing the object that you're sensing. And these say this would be stable. So this would be like, this is the cup you're touch touching. Um, and that would be stable because you're, even though your finger's moving and the inputs are changing, the locations are changing, your perception of the cup is not changing. It doesn't feel like the cup is moving. So that would, there would be a stable thing we, I labeled here object. And then we said, what happens when you have three fingers touching the cup, like I mentioned a moment ago. And in this case, they have different locations and they have different sensations. And so they each are independently trying to figure out what they're touching, but they can vote. And there's these connections in the cortex that go across um, uh, columns. And we, th we think they're voting. What there's going on is each of these things says, well, I, I have some hypothesis about what I'm feeling. And I have an hypothesis about what I'm feeling. And I have an hypothesis about what I'm feeling. And if I could move, I could figure it out. But together we can figure it out very quickly. And this is why sometimes you can just, you know what an object is by just grasping it. Similar thing would be happening in vision. In vision, we think of it like processing a picture, but that's not really true. Um, what's going on is that the, pat the back of the retina, you have an image, but then there's these patches of the retina that project to different columns. And it's like each column is looking at the world through a narrow straw. 
And on its own, it would have to move to see what the object is. But together they can vote. And this is why when I just flash an image in front of your eyes, you can recognize it. But if I make you look through a narrow opening, you have to move it around. Uh, it's very analogous to the fingers. So the question we then had to answer was, well, how could neurons do create these reference frames? This seems crazy. You know, how could they calculate reference frames and attach them to objects? Do they move with the objects? Uh, fortunately, uh, we know that they could do that because they, neurons that do this were discovered in an older part of the brain. So those of you who follow neuroscience may have heard of grid cells and place cells. These are famous, um, uh, well-studied um, um, uh, types of cells that exist in an older part of the brain, the hippocampus and the anterior cortex. Two Nobel Prizes were won for discovering these, uh, these cells. Um, and what they do uh, is that they, they basically learn a map of the environment you're in. So if you're in a room, your grid cells and place cells tell you where, are, where you are in that room. Uh, if a rat, you're in a box and tells you where you are in that box or in a maze, that kind of thing. And what we, we, what we figured out, we said, look, there must be an equivalent mechanism in the cortex. So evolution had, had taken these grid cells and play cells, which were designed for figuring out where you are in some environment, uh, rat in a maze, that kind of thing. And, but now it's using them in the cortex to see where, where your sensory organs are relative to things in the world. And so we, we now, we said, well, we think those grid cells and play cells in every cortical uh, equivalent to every, in every cortical column. Here's a, a, a schematic which sort of illustrates that. Um, just on the left, this is sort of a typical experiment, a rat in a box, they measure from the grid cells and the grid cells in a very complicated way, which I won't explain, um, basically learn a reference frame for the room that the rat is in. And so it can tell you, oh, you're in location D or location E or location F, the rat knows this. You do it too when you walk around the room. But the same basic thing is going on with your finger. Your, as your finger moves around an object, it's basically like the rat in the room. It's basically saying, where am I relative to this object? And I can start learning a structure of this, this thing. So this now, this was a, it's basically we had the core idea how cortical columns work. And now we have to ask ourselves how the whole neocortex works and how the hierarchy in the neocortex works. And our thinking about this has changed dramatically in the last five years. Um, here's how people typically think about the, the hierarchy in the cortex. And this is how the classic neural networks work. You have some input, let's say from the retina, you then process it in the first level of a layer of cells, you extract some simple features, and then you pass it to the next layer and you extract some complex features and you do this a few more times until you have a representation that can be, uh, can be classified. Um, uh, there's some truth to that, but there's more non-truth to it than there's truth to it. And, and so now we, we have a, and, and here's an image which sort of illustrates some of the problems. This is a famous neuroscience image, but basically what it's showing is the little rectangles are parts of the neocortex and the lines are showing how they're connected together. And so on the left, you have this simple idea of a flow chart. And on the right, you have reality of what it looks like. And what we see is that most of the regions or the most areas of the cortex, most layers, if you will, are, are, are not hierarchical. Um, most of the connections are not. More than 40% of all possible connections exist. Um, the, the connections go all over the place, up, down, left, right. And, um, and there's other things that are weird, like the, the primary sensory cortices, like the first V1 V or S1, these are the first regions that get input from the senses. You might think they're just extracting features. They don't have to be very big, but they tend to be the largest regions in the neocortex. And so that doesn't make any sense either. And then we see that cells in the, the visual cortex have some responses to, to sounds and to touch and the other way around. So that doesn't make sense in this hierarchy content too. So here's how we think about it now. Um, it's, it's a bit more complicated. What we think is going on, these, these are showing two simple hierarchies, one for the retina, uh, for vision and one for touch. And I'm sort of illustrating these little rectangles. Those are like columns in the, in the cortex. And each column is building models. So at, at different levels in the whole cortex, you have models of multiple models of the same thing. There are, if I ask myself, where there's a model of a coffee cup? Well, there's thousands of models of the coffee cup in my cortex. Not every column, mind you, a subset, a small subset of the columns, but there's still thousands of them. And, um, and they're, they're di representing different, some, some of these models are visual, some are tactile, some will be uh, how it sounds. Some will be at different scales. So they're not identical, um, but there, 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 there are just many of these models going on at once. We call this the thousand brains theory. And the blue lines are to indicate this voting. And so what's going on is all these models are working simultaneously trying to figure out from their input and their movement and their location, what they're sensing. And, um, yet, and then they vote and they reach a consensus. And that consensus is what you perceive. You, don't under, you, don't, you never perceive all the, the, the noisy stuff that's going underneath it. You, you, your, your perception is stable. And even though your eyes are moving and your fingers are moving. And so most of these long range of connections for, uh, are for voting. Um, and there's still a hierarchy, but the hierarchy is we're passing, we believe is passing complete objects between layers, not um, uh, features.
Um, there is a huge amount of growing evidence, I said to you, there's a growing evidence for this theory. Uh, it's in, and I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna go through them today, but this is just an image from one of these famous experiments now, um, a very clever experiment, where they've been able to start showing that in the cortex there are grid cells. And they've been able to determine this. And uh, I just got a paper a couple of weeks ago uh, showing those grid cell-like structures in V1 and S1. Um, and so uh, this idea is gonna grow and there's more and more evidence supporting it. So in summary, um, intelligence requires learning a model of the world. And uh, each cortical column is composed of a complete sensory motor modeling system. The columns wrote to reach consensus. Uh, and, uh, and cortical columns use reference frame to represent knowledge. I didn't go through the, how we represent all knowledge this way, but reference frames are how we represent, represent all knowledge in the cortex. Um, and uh, whether it's objects, your own body, you have models of your own body or concepts. And I believe that uh, true machine intelligence or AGI, if you prefer that term, uh, must work on these principles. I, I think we have to do that. If you wanna learn more about this, we have a whole bunch of neuroscience papers uh, the best way to do go about them would be go to our website because we have an annotated list there and you can sort of figure out what they're all about, but they're hard to read. And if you're not a neuroscientist, it can be impossible to read. <laughs> well, very, very difficult. Um, fortunately, um, we have some other materials that are easy to read. Uh, I have a new book that just came out two weeks ago, literally two weeks ago, uh, called A Thousand Brains. And that book, um, is, the first section is all about the neuroscience, what I mostly talked about here today, but I really developed the theory. The second is all about the implications of AI. Um, and how I think this is going to impact AI and how AI is going to, going to progress going forward. And the third section of the book is about the implications for society. Um, I, I'm not trying to promote books, but I do think this would be a really good place if you're interested in this area uh, to read that. And that's why I wrote the book. Okay. Um, now, what we've done at Nementa is we've, we've sort of created a roadmap. We said, like, oh, how do we get to this? How could we get to truly intelligent machines? And... Um, and we, on the left of this roadmap is where we are today in machine learning with convolutional neural networks or transformers, things like that. And, and where we wanna be on the right is, you know, the sort of the full brain model uh, theory. And, and uh, my colleague Subutai, who's gonna talk right in a second, he come up with this roadmap where we, we start off by saying, okay, let's do, what can we do incrementally to get our way there? And the first thing is we, is we did, is we had to build a whole, um, I had to work on sparsity. I didn't talk about that, but the underlying everything the cortex does is sparsity. And so um, we've made a lot of progress in there. We started working on continuous learning, which requires an active dendrite model. And, and then we've also started working on reference frames. Ultimately, we'd like to get to the entire thousand brains theory. With that, I'm gonna turn it over now to uh, Subutai and, um, and uh, he is gonna pick up the conversation. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen here. Okay, can you guys see the see the screen? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Jeff talked about this roadmap and laid out some of the neuroscience uh, foundations and components for it. He focused on the reference frames and, and model voting. Uh, so my talk is gonna be a little bit different, uh, uh, this part. And what I'm gonna do is focus on realization. Like how do we go about taking these ideas and actually implement them in practical systems? And to that end, I'm going to focus on one specific piece of this, which is sparsity. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the properties of sparse networks, how they're instantiated in the brain, and what we've done to train sparse networks, and then uh, some of the recent progress we've made in sort of implementing them in hardware and realizing some of the performance gains and robustness gains that, that come out of sparse systems. Okay, so uh, I think in this community, most of you know that uh, the, neo the neocortex is pretty sparse. Uh, but it may be surprising to know just how sparse it actually is in, in the neocortex. So this video here shows uh, uh, calcium imaging data. It's showing uh, neurons that are firing in, a, in the neocortex of a mouse as that animal is performing uh, tasks live. And every time there's a white dot that flashes, there's a neuron that's actually spiking. And this, this square, this black rectangle, is actually packed with neurons. So you can see that at any point in time, only a small percentage of the neurons are actually active. And so your neocortex is working exactly like this right now. Every part of your neocortex is operating in an, in an extremely sparse fashion, just like this. And as you're listening to me and understanding me and, and my neocortex as I'm generating this uh, speech is operating in this sort of sparse manner here. Um, what's pretty surprising is sort of how sparse uh, it is. And it turns out if you, actually quantitatively measure the, the activity of neurons and the neocortex. At any point in time, only about 0.5% to 2% of neurons 
are actually active. And you could sort of see that in the, in the video that I just showed. It turns out that the connectivity between layers is also extremely sparse. So if you look at a layer of neurons that's projecting to another layer of neurons, only about one to 5% of the possible connections actually exist uh, between two connected layers. Um, and a remarkable property is that this uh, connectivity is actually extremely dynamic through processes such as structural plasticity, something like 30% of the connections change every few days. So if you think, and this is in adults as well. Uh, so if you think about the connections that are in, in your neocortex, a few days from now, 30% of those won't, be, won't exist and there'll be another 30% that don't exist, so that, that, that will exist a few days from now. So we are constantly trying to learn by adding and dropping connections in this incredibly uh, sparse structure. And of course, this is nothing like today's dense deep learning systems. Um, in, in today's deep learning systems, the connectivity is extremely sparse, the activity is uh, extremely dense, and the connectivity is, uh, the activity is very dense as well. Um, if you kind of analyze this mathematically and you look at the vectors that are involved in here, what you'll realize is that the sparse representations that are represented in the neocortex are extremely high dimensional. And it turns out this is actually quite important. Um, and what you can show mathematically is that high dimensional sparse representations are extremely robust to both noise and failure. So individual neurons can, fa can fail, a, even a large group of neurons can fail and everything is just fine. You can have a, a quite a bit of noise in the system and the system can operate just fine. And we've sort of, we've quantified this mathematically and you can see on this, uh, let me get my laser pointer here. You can see on this sort of graph on the right, a depiction of that. Uh, so on the y-axis, I'm showing the probability of, of false matches. Um, and on the x-axis, I'm showing uh, the dimensionality of the system. And each of these curves shows a fixed number of non-zeros uh, in the vector. And as you can see, the probability of errors drops almost exponentially as you start increasing the dimensionality. So this is a pretty remarkable property that, this, that sparse representations are extremely stable. Um, uh, stable to perturbations. What's interesting, and, and another way to kind of say this, is that the information content of sparse vectors increases with dimensionality without introducing any additional non-zeros. So if you think about a vector, let's say you have a hundred a vector with a hundred components, maybe 10 of them are non-zero. Those vectors have certain information content. Now imagine a vector with 10,000 components still with 10 non-zeros in there that vector now has a, a lot more information content in there, even though the number of non-zeros hasn't changed. Uh, you can kind of flip this around and you can say, okay, for a given task, you can actually reduce the number of non-zero parameters and non-zero weights that are required simply by increasing the dimensionality. And from a scaling standpoint and hardware implementation standpoint, this is a great property. Um, typically, you know, speed and performance is really dependent on the number of non-zero parameters. And with these kind of scaling laws, you can actually reduce the number of non-zero parameters, thereby increase the, the overall performance uh, of the system. So uh, there are a lot more properties of sparse representation, but these are some of the, the important ones that, that we've looked at. Okay, so how do we uh, take these ideas and actually create sparse networks in them? Um, what I'm showing here is an example of the type of sparse deep networks that we create. On the left-hand side, you see a typical uh, dense network. Uh, they're densely connected and, and most of the uh, neurons and units are active at any point in time. On the right-hand side, these are the types of networks we create where the connectivity is sparse and the activity itself is, is sparse as well. So let me zoom into one of these layers and show you how we uh, implement that. So here's a, a depiction of one layer. On the left-hand side, I'm showing a standard dense uh, layer in a typical deep network. You have your weight matrix, which is dense. You do a linear weighted sum of the input and you pass it through some nonlinearity like a ReLU function. On the right is the type of uh, sparse layers that we create. And there's two, two big differences here. Uh, first of all, the, the weights themselves are sparse. So this is enforced by a mass so that a small percentage of the connections that are possible actually do exist. And then instead of a ReLU, uh, what we have are sparse activations. We use something called a K-winner take-all layer to enforce that the activity itself is sparse. So we look at the linear weighted sum and we just keep the top K units active and, and the rest are set to zero. So these uh, layers can be embedded in uh, deep learning systems. 
There's one trick to it as you get to higher and higher dimensions. When you do, uh, uh, when you create sparse uh, layers, it's pretty uh, common that a few units will start to become active. They will sort of learn the patterns and they will stay, they will tend to become active a lot more than the other uh, units. And to avoid that issue, we use something called a boosting term, which uh, uh, favors unit, units which have low activation frequency. And this helps maximize the overall entropy of the, uh, of the layer and ensures we get good representations. So uh, some of you who are familiar with our work on, on uh, previous work will kind of recognize this as essentially our spatial cooler. Um, this is almost exactly like the spatial cooler that we had implemented before, except now it's implemented in, the, in a way that can be dropped into uh, any uh, deep learning system. And, and I've described sort of linear layers, but we have uh, extensions for spark, to create sparse convolutional layers as well. So we've tested these networks on a variety of different data sets. I'm gonna use one data set uh, for most of the uh, next few slides here, uh, and that is the Google speech command data set. So this is a data set of spoken commands. So think of uh, things like Alexa or Siri and so on. Uh, these are, uh, the data set consists of one word utterances uh, spoken by thousands of individuals. Uh, state of the art accuracy on this data set is around 95% to 97.5% uh, for 10 categories. And we created uh, dense and sparse networks on this uh, data set. And we also tested the robustness to, to noise. So this table here shows uh, some of our results and I'll just walk you through it. So there are two different rows here uh, for a dense convolutional network and a sparse convolutional network. And the first thing to notice is that the accuracy is about the same for both. They're all well within the standard deviation error at right around 97%. Uh, what's interesting is you can look at the accuracy of these networks as you add more and more noise to it. And if you look at the average accuracy across a, a lot of noise, you can see that the sparse networks are significantly better with noise uh, compared to dense networks. And on the, the right two columns, I'm showing the actual number of uh, non-zero weights or uh, sparsity of these, of these systems. Uh, the dense convolutional network has 1.7 million uh, non-zero weights here. And so the sparsity is uh, 0%. The sparse network actually has about a 10th of this, about 160,000 weights. And so the sparsity is at uh, 90%. So it's pretty remarkable that with this level of sparsity, you can still maintain this accuracy. And we tried to uh, test some of this hypotheses around dimensionality. Is it, the, is it the size of the weights? Is it the size of the layers? What is actually behind it? And this, um, this, the next few rows here sort of show uh, some recent results on that. What we tried to do is create smaller versions of the dense networks to see if we can reduce the number of parameters and still keep it dense. And what you can see starts to happen is that the accuracy starts to drop quite a bit. Um, so when you have a dense network, once you start to reduce the number of non-zero weights, you'll start to reduce the number of uh, parameters. So it's really, there's something about uh, the, 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 the activity being embedded in a larger uh, system that's causing this accuracy. And the, the lowest row here on sparse large, what we did is uh, just double the size of the network. We doubled the size of the linear layer here and we maintained the same accuracy. So you still get the uh, high dimensional, I mean, I'm sorry, the, the you know 97% accuracy. But what we're able to do here is actually significantly reduce the number of non-zero weights. So here we're down to 64,000 uh, non-zero weights with a sparsity about 98.1%. So this starts to get very close to the types of sparsities that we see in the neocortex. And again, shows how by increasing the dimensionality, increasing the size of the network, you can actually reduce the number of weights. So we've now taken these networks and tried to implement them on hardware to see if we can uh, realize the performance gains uh, from this level of sparsity. And we looked at a few different systems. Um, we've, uh, I'll tell you some, about some of our work on FPGAs. With FPGAs, we can control the exact circuitry a little more. Uh, sparse networks tend to be highly non simd like, and so uh, we don't think they're a great fit for GPUs, but with FPGAs, we can really control some of the circuitry and, and focus on, on actually leveraging uh, the non-zeros in, in the system. So we looked at uh, implementing both sparse and dense networks on three different off-the-shelf Silinx chips. Um, and these three chips are designed for data center applications and embedded sort of internet of things applications. And they're current generation uh, chips that are available on the market. 
So these three th columns show the actual chips that we uh, deployed on. So on the left is the their Alveo chip, which is a high-end chip or, or card that's uh, designed for data centers. And on the right, we have the extremely small ZU3EG chip. Um, it's got less than a megabyte of memory. And this is really designed for uh, embedded Internet of Things types of applications. And what we're able to show is that by implementing uh, the, our sparse networks, we can get a dramatic speed up uh, thanks to sparsity. We're actually able to get about a 50x speed up uh, thanks to the sparse networks on these FPGA chips. So this table shows uh, a lot of numbers and um, with our results and I'll walk you through some of these here. So if you look at a single network that's running on the Alveo chip, a single sparse network runs about 10 times faster than the equivalent dense uh, optimized dense network. So a sparse network can process about 31,000 uh, words per second on the Alveo, where a dense network uh, only processes about 3,000 words per second. Um, what's interesting, though, is that in addition to the pure speed up for a single network, the size of each network is much smaller, the size of each sparse network. And we're able to fit about five times as many sparse networks on the chip as the dense network. So we can fit about 20 of them versus uh, four of them. So if you multiply that out, we get a full chip speed up of about 50x uh, over the dense network. Um, the, the other thing I want to point out here is that if you look at the really tiny ZU3EG chip, the dense network doesn't even fit on that chip. So I'm calling this an infinite speed up. Um, what's interesting to me is that even in this tiny chip, the sparse networks run at about 21,000 words per second which is almost twice as fast as four of the dense networks on this high-end uh, Alveo card. So you get a really dramatic uh, uh, speed up even on these, uh, uh, on these tiny chips. And this also shows how you can take sparse networks and now through, um, and then you can run them on systems that previously could not run these convolutional networks or these uh, dense networks. So a whole new category of applications actually open up in here. Um, we looked at the energy uh, usage of these uh, sparse systems. As you can imagine, the energy also is, uh, it's, uh, it's a lot more efficient. So if you look at this number here, uh, what we're showing here is that a single sparse network can be about 20, more than 25 times ener as energy efficient as the best, most efficient uh, dense network. So it can run about uh, 2,700 words per watt, uh, these systems. Um, uh, these are still not quite as efficient as the Lohi chips that uh, Mike Davis showed yesterday. And it'd be interesting to see how some of these systems can translate to, uh, to that sort of chipset. But overall, uh, by creating these really high dimensional sparse networks, you can uh, get dramatic performance benefits and, and dramatic energy efficiencies. Um, right. We've also looked at now applying these to harder data sets such as ImageNet and, and uh, ResNet 50 uh, type networks. And to do that, we had to actually implement structural plasticity in a way that uh, benefits the hardware. So I'll walk through what we did there. So what we've implemented is block, a type of block sparse weights where the blocks are actually dynamic and trained using a, a variational technique. And we're training it in a way that it represents hardware constraints. So in this uh, matrix here, it's showing uh, uh, a block sparse uh, matrix. All the black areas are zeros and the red parts are, are non-zeros. And the way we train it is that if you look at an individual weight, each of the weights are noisy and we can control the amount of noise. And by training with noise, we can actually make the weights a lot more quantizable. Uh, in addition, uh, during training, we, each block has a probability of being on or off and we can tune that probability. And so the network actually learns the, the uh, sparse structure, the block sparse structure that's optimal for a given task. And the last thing here that uh, we can do is actually we can control the number of non-zero blocks per column in order to get very, very balanced computations. And through this uh, scheme, we're able to uh, train very accurate, uh, uh, very sparse uh, networks on ImageNet. So we created a sparse version of ResNet 50 that's trained on uh, the thousand category ImageNet and it's trained using the structural plasticity scheme I just talked about. And uh, this table shows some of the accuracy results. Uh, if you look at the first row, this is the MLPerf benchmark for dense networks. They expect uh, after accuracy, uh, an ac after uh, quantization, an accuracy of about 
uh, for these dense networks. And they expect about a 1% uh, hit to, due to quantization on there. Um, NVIDIA, uh, a, a few months ago on their Ampere architecture, introduced a static sparse network that was about 50% sparse, and they were able to get about 76.8% accuracy uh, after quantization. The, the bottom two rows shows our networks with static sparsity and with the dynamic structural sparsity that I showed here. And the thing to focus here is that, on is that we can create networks that are 75% sparse. So only one in four weights are actually non-zero. So this is half the number of parameters as the 50% as the sparse network. But we're able to maintain the 76.8% accuracy. And what's interesting to see here is that the drop due to quantization, because we're training with these noisy weights, uh, is far less than what you typically see um, as an impact of quantization. So our, we're in the process of implementing this on FPGAs. So I can't share results yet, but hopefully uh, in the next couple of months, we'll be able to share some of the performance results. But the takeaway here is that through structural plasticity, we're actually able to create really sparse networks with high accuracy on extremely challenging data sets uh, like the MeshNet. Um, so okay. we're out of time. Okay. I've been a bad host, but nice to you. <laughs> we are okay. min minus one minute. So maybe if you could wrap up, I, I hope yeah. just with a couple of questions. Okay, so this is the last slide. Um, so I'm sort of zooming back out into the roadmap that, uh, that Jeff laid out. Um, I talked about sparsity um, and how we can realize performance and robustness gains as a function of sparsity. I showed about, talked about how we can do sparse activations and weights and through structural plasticity, create extremely accurate networks that are very efficient. Um, if you look at some of these other components, uh, we're starting to work on those now. Uh, the active dendrites is an extremely uh, active area of research for us. If you're familiar with our sequence memory and what we've done uh, on that front, uh, what we're focusing on here is through compartmentalized neurons, uh, creating systems that are continuously learning and learning in a predictive way, in a self-supervised way. And this will allow us to train networks with far less labeled data with very small number of training passes. Uh, Jeff talked about reference frames. This will enable us to have invariant representations, which will allow us to train with much smaller training sets, will allow us to create compositional structures and improve the overall generalization of the system. And finally, uh, we want to realize the full common cortical algorithm. This is the common repeating circuit for intelligence. It relies on everything else here on the left. But once we implement this, we have a very highly scalable integrated sensory motor systems. This is really what's required to create truly advanced robotics and truly intelligent systems. And I think what's exciting for us is for the first time, we have a really concrete algorithmic roadmap where we can start with sparsity and implement all of these different components. We understand how they work from a neuroscience standpoint, and we're starting to understand how they'll be realized in hardware and algorithmically.